This teaching you're about to listen to was preached by Jagedis Sunday E and recorded live at God's Family Bible Church, Trinidad. Jagedis Sunday E is the general coordinator of Arabs of Revival Ministries and the School of Discipleship. He is also the missionary pastor of GFBC Trinidad under the leadership of Pastor Abology Akimbo the General Overseer of God's Family Bible Church Worldwide, Palm Coast, Florida. Listen and be transformed. Our Father, we want to thank you for such a privilege to come to your presence this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your loving kindness towards us. This morning, Lord, we have come to hear your word. We ask, O oh God, for hearing ears. We ask for seeing eyes. We ask for understanding heart. Lord, bless us with understanding of your world this morning. Thank you, Father. And in Jesus' name we pray. Can I hear you say loud, Amen? Amen. Glory be to Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, for some weeks now, we have been considering uh, what I call understanding the essence of the gospel. Understanding the essence of the gospel. And this is going to be part four. So I'm continuing today. Uh, with this teaching series that I call Understanding the Essence of the Gospel. And don't forget what we mean by that is you understanding uh, the distinguished uh, property, defining property, distinguished features of the gospel, the basic nature. There are truths you need to know about the gospel. There are gosp gospel truths that you need to know. And we said, uh, among several things, the reason why you need to know this is so that you will not be deceived, so that you will not be deceived. We are in the last days, and these days are days of much deception. And if you don't know the truth, you can be deceived. You can be manipulated. You can be exploited. Even in the name of God, you understand? Even in the name of religion. Even in the name of Christ. Jesus warned us that in the last day, many will come in my name, and they will deceive many people. So if I don't want to be deceived, I need to know the truth for myself. So when we talk about the gospel, there are truths about the gospel that we need to know so that someone will not tell you that, well, if you want God to love you, then these are the things you have to do. But the gospel truth is saying, no, God loves the sinners. You don't need to do anything to impress God for God to love you, all right? Someone may tell you if you want uh, God's blessing, you want God's favor, you want this miracle, then you have to give this. You have to do this for God, all right? Now, so these are the things we'll be considering, but that we know that every blessing of God has been fully paid for by Christ for us, all right? And so that's why we learn about the gospel of grace. And so far, we've, we've considered a lot of things about the gospel. And what I've been trying to do is to explore the scripture, to explore the Bible, and then we try and see what does the Bible actually teach about the gospel. How do we know this is to consider what, what I call the designations of the gospel, the appellation, the adjectives that are used in the Bible to qualify the gospel. You, you understand? To describe the gospel to all. So what we are looking at in the Bible is that we are, we are considering the tags on the gospel. All right? So, you know, we, we are looking at uh, things that the scripture says about the gospel that we call appellation, tags, descriptions of the gospel. And so we try to look at them one after the other. And each of these reveal to us a uh, uh, peculiar uh, nature or distinguished future of the gospel. Take for instance, we have considered the gospel of God. So why is the gospel called the gospel of God? And we realize because it, God is the author. God is the one that, that, that planned the gospel. You understand? And don't forget, gospel is good news. Alright, so it was God's plan. It was God's initiative to save all. So that is why the gospel is called the gospel of God. We, we look at the gospel of the grace of God. And I told you grace means gift. It means favor. So it is, it is the salvation is God's gift to all. It's free. That's what it means. But of course, it doesn't mean it's cheap. Somebody pay for it. And the price that was paid for our salvation is the death of Jesus on the cross. All right? So the blood of Jesus. We talk about the gospel as the gospel of the kingdom of God. That means it is the gospel of power. And of course, last week we look at the gospel as the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of the glory of Jesus Christ. And of course, as the gospel of peace. Now, I don't want to be going into 
all the things we've covered before because of time. But of course, you know, we have uh, our teachings always on YouTube, on uh, the church uh, Facebook uh, page. You can go back and listen to it. And of course, on our uh, weekly podcast. Now, so today we are looking at three things. We've been looking at the gospel as the gospel of righteousness. We look at the gospel as the gospel of his salvation. And also we look at the gospel as the everlasting gospel. So why is the gospel called the gospel of righteousness? Why is the gospel called the gospel of salvation? Why is it called the everlasting gospel? That's what we are considering today. Are you ready for that? All right. So let's start with the gospel of righteousness. Let's have say the gospel of righteousness. Gospel of righteousness. Turn with me to the book of Psalm chapter 40. So why is the gospel the gospel of righteousness? Why is it the good news of righteousness? What kind of righteousness is the Bible talking about? Psalm chapter 40. Let's start from verse 6. Psalm 40. Look at it from verse 6. <clears throat> Are we all there? All right. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Tell somebody say, God has opened my ears. All right. He said, burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Can you imagine? This was David, but he's a prophetic psalm. Even though David was under the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant. And under that covenant, when you sin, then you need to buy an animal. All right. You know, and take it to the priest and then they slay it and offer it on the altar. Okay, as your sin offering or burnt offering or whatever. But David, by the Spirit of God, was prophesying that God did not really desire that. That this is not the real thing. It's just a shadow of things to come. That God has a plan. God has something better than the sin offering and the burnt offering. And what is that? God has prepared his son. As a lamb, as, as an ultimate bond offering for all, as ultimate sin offering for all. That's what he's talking about. Okay, now look at verse 7. I said, then I said, behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your Lord is within my heart. Now, verse 9 is where I'm coming to. I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness. Let's have said the good news of righteousness. <laughs> Okay, in a great assembly, indeed, I do not restrain my lips, O Lord, you yourself know verse 10, I have not hidden your righteousness. You see, the Y in the Bible here is capital letter, so it's talking of God's righteousness. Within my heart, I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. So David referred to the gospel here. The gospel here is called good news. He referred to it as the good news of righteousness. So why is it the good news of righteousness? What kind of righteousness is he talking about? Call you, when you refer to verse 10, he says your righteousness. So he's talking about God's whole righteousness. So what is the good news to us in these? All right, now listen to these. Now, the gospel is called the gospel of righteousness because the gospel revealed to us God's kind of righteousness. Now listen to this. That is apart from the law. So in the gospel, we see that it is possible to be righteous without keeping the law of God, as it were. All right? They say, but how is that possible? That's what the gospel is. So the gospel is saying you can attain righteousness while you are not doing everything right or perfect. That in God's sight, you can be righteous. Are you listening to me? Yet without keeping all the law of God. Without doing everything right and perfect all the time. That's what the gospel, that's why it's called the gospel of righteousness. Because the gospel offers to us God's own righteousness as a gift. Now, listen to this. When we talk of righteousness in a lay language, simple definition, it means doing the right thing. Is that right? Okay, right thing. Being upright, doing the right thing. All right. But do you know in God's sight, righteousness is not primarily your action. Righteousness is a state, it's a status, it's a condition, not necessarily an action. Now, in God's sight, you can be doing things right, all right, but God does not see you as righteous. Do you know why? Because God does not just consider your actions, He weighs your motives. But most times we do the right thing, but with the wrong motives. 
You, you understand what I'm, I don't know whether you have met people like that. All right. They do the right thing, but for wrong reasons. I've met a lot of people like that. They are doing the right thing. But when you find out where they're doing it, it's for wrong reason. So what do you say to them? So that is why to God, you are not righteous because you are doing things right. Righteousness to God is a state, is a condition. Righteousness in the Bible, now listen to me in God's sight, is having a right standing with God. He's having a status, a right status with God. Righteousness is being justified by God. So righteousness with God, now listen to me, is not what you do, it's who you are. Now we're going to see this in the Bible. And the gospel, now listen to this, there is none of all that can attain the standard of righteousness that God expects from us. There is no man that can attain the standard of righteousness that the law of God prescribes. Because that means, take for instance, Ten Commandments. If you want to be righteous based on your actions, then you have to keep Ten Commandments, not just on Sunday, okay, but every other day of the week. But history has proved that there is no one, are you listening to me, that has kept the law of God without stumbling in one point. But the issue is this, James chapter 2 verse 10 says, if you keep all the law and then you make mistake in one, then you are a transgressor of law. You are guilty of all. And that is the challenge. And all of us have sinned. We have the nature of sin. So nobody can attain that righteousness that can make him stand before God and say, God, now check me. I am perfect in every way. There is no one that is perfect in every way. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, of the standard of God. Are you listening to me? So, how do we not have a right standing with God? How can we not approach the Holy God if we are not righteous? How can we receive from the Holy God if we are unclean? Do you know the solution? Then God himself made available to us his own righteousness as a gift. And how do we receive that righteousness when we believe the gospel? The good news. That's why the gospel is also called the gospel of righteousness. Are you with me? Alright, let's, let, let's, let's look at the scripture. Look at Romans chapter 3. Let's start from Romans chapter 3. So in the gospel, the righteousness of God, apart from the Lord, is revealed. The righteousness that is called the righteousness of faith. Now look at what the Bible says here. The book of Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. The book of Romans chapter 3. Look at it from verse 19. Romans chapter 3. So the gospel offers us righteousness of God as a gift. So in the gospel, a man that is not doing everything right can be righteous and have a right standing with God simply by faith, by believing in the Lord Jesus, the Savior, and what he has done for him. Romans chapter 3, I read from verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stored and all the world may become guilty before God. All right? I've seen a lot of people hacking. You know, and say, well, when you say the New Testament saints, they are not under the law. But they say, but God gave the law. But the primary purpose of the Lord is not for you to keep it. The primary purpose of the Lord is to make every person, every person become guilty before God. The Bible says it is to stop every mouth, to end our boasting. Alright? Are you listening to what I'm talking about? So that nobody can stand before God and say, I am righteous. <laughs> Because if God examines you, you are failing in one area. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? That's the purpose of the law. The Lord is to assure us that none of us can boast before God. Now, let's go further. Verse 20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. Can you see that in your Bible? That is by trying to keep the law, by your works, by your, by your character, by what you do. The Bible says you will never be justified. Be justified means to have a right standing with God. The, to be justified means for God to examine you and say, you are perfect, you are acceptable, I accept you. You can stand before me. You can receive from me. So the Bible says, by keeping the law, nobody can attain that. Now, it says, for by the Lord is the knowledge of sin. So when the Lord said, thou shalt not steal, then you know that there's something that is God stealing, all right? If the Lord has not said, thou shalt not steal, even when you are stealing, you don't know what to call it. <laughs> Alright, okay, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God. Take note, let's all say, but now. But now. Alright, the righteousness of God. 
That is what the gospel gives. So the Bible says, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law. What does it mean apart from the law? It means the righteousness of God that somebody can get without keeping the law. It's revealed. So the gospel reveals the righteousness of God that is apart from the law. That is why the gospel is described as the gospel of righteousness. Because it reveals, it make known that I can be righteous in the sight of God yet without doing everything right. That God can look at me and say, you are righteous. I'm pleased with you. But you can look at me and say, no, this guy is failing in many areas. It's because the righteousness God is referring to is not the righteousness that you are referring to. You are referring to my action. Are you listening to me? But God is talking about my status. We're going to check that. So there's a difference. You, you understand? Now, we, let's read for that. So righteousness of God, apart from the Lord, is revealed. Be witnessed by the Lord and the prophet. Now, even in the Old Testament, the Lord and the prophet, they testify to him. We're going to check that. Now, even the righteousness of God, how does he come? He said it come through faith in Jesus Christ. Let's say faith in Jesus Christ. So this righteousness that the gospel reveals, this righteousness that God offers us, this right standard, the Bible says, it can only be receive true faith in Jesus Christ. Not by doing things right. Are you listening to me? So that is why some people will go to hellfire in spite of being better than other Christians. <laughs> Are you listening to me? Now the reason why they go to hellfire is because they put their confidence in themselves. Not in the Savior. Now and when you look at them, they are awesome people. They are kind. They are generous. They are thoughtful. They are considerate. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? But because our righteousness cannot get a stand with God. <laughs> our righteousness cannot open the gates of heaven for all. Because our righteousness, the Bible says, Isaiah 64 verse 6, our righteousnesses are like filter rag. In other words, there is not a world that can be so righteous to the extent that when you die, God will admit you into heaven. Our righteousness cannot stand in the presence of the Holy God. And so God made provision for us to have his own righteousness as, as a robe, as a garment. You understand? And the Bible says God's righteousness is only received through faith in Christ Jesus. And that is the gospel. So the gospel is that somebody that's, that is not doing things right, that in his actions is, is failing. You can look at him, you can examine, examine him or her 24 hours, and then you see him that almost every hour of the day, she's failing, she's making mistakes. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? But when you ask God, God, what do you think about her? God says she's righteous. And then you say, God, you, you, you don't just understand what she just said, what she just did. It's because the righteousness that God is talking is imputed. It's a gift. All right, let, let, let's go for that. We, we, get, we get it now. Okay, so it says, verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus to all and all who believe. So there is a righteousness of God. Now, this righteousness of God is the one that qualifies us to stand before God. It is the righteousness of God that we gets you, admit us into heaven when you die. And the Bible says it is only given to those who believe in Christ Jesus. That is why good people will not make heaven. <laughs> you understand? It is believers that make heaven, not good people. Because no matter how good they are, God will find fault with their goodness. Alright? Now, so let's look at Romans chapter 4. Come to the next chapter. I just want you to understand this very well. So, the gospel revealed the righteousness of God as a gift given to those who believe in Christ. Romans chapter 4, look at it from verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? Verse 2. For if Abraham was justified by works, that is by his action, by what he does, by his performance, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Now here Paul is bringing Abraham into it. He said, you know Abraham, the man that God called my friend, the man that God called and he blessed and he made a covenant with him, and the covenant that is still in existence up to now. He said, do you know how he got the blessing? Do you know how he had that? He said, it is not by his works. 
When somebody tells you what God is going to give to you, it's based on your word. That is not the gospel. That's not the gospel. That's, that's why I want you to understand the gospel. Yesterday, the brother that we are ministering to, he was telling us that, well, he knows why all this thing is happening to him because of his unfaithfulness. I said, what are you talking about? I said, it's because you don't come to church. That's why you don't understand that God does not deal with her based on our own words and our righteousness. He's based on faith in Christ. You understand? So if somebody tells you, now, now, what you are going to get from God or the way God is going to deal with you is based on your righteousness. That person is not preaching the gospel to you. Alright, so we see here that Abraham that was justified, that was blessed, the Bible says it was not by his works. That guy knows how to tell lies. <laughs> how many of you know that about Abraham? Yeah. Alright, okay. Now, so, but yet, God said, that is my friend. That's my friend. God bless him. God made a covenant with him. Now look at what he said, verse 3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for what? Righteousness. Can you see what the scripture is talking about? So it is by believing that God credited righteousness to his account. It was not by his living right or doing things right. Does that mean we should not live right or do it? Of course, you should do. All right? But what I'm saying that in relationship, in dealing with God, that's not what God is looking at. What God is looking at is faith. What pleases God is faith, yeah. not what you do. <laughs> you know, that's what some people don't really understand. But that's the gospel, and it's simple. That, now, listen to what it says. He believed God, and it was what? Accounted. That's an account word. It was input. It was given to him. It was credited to him for righteousness. So to God, believing is righteousness. Do you understand what? I, but to us, it's working, it's action that we call righteousness. But to God, is what? It's your faith. Believing God. Believing what God says about his son Jesus. That he died for your sin. That he rose up for your justification. Believe what God says about him. Now look at what he said, verse 4 now. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as death. Verse 5. But to him who does not work, but believe on him who justify the ungodly, his faith is what? Accounted for righteousness. That's somebody say, my faith is accounted for righteousness. Can you see what the Bible says? So your faith is what God accounts for as righteousness. Not your actions, not what you do. Your faith. So that is why this righteousness that the gospel gives to all is only received by faith. It is faith that equal righteousness in God's son. Let's read further. Verse 5. But to him who does not work but believe on him who justifies faith is accounted for righteousness. 6 now. Just as David also described the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from what? Do you see that in your Bible? <clears throat> that God did what? Inputs. God puts righteousness with our works. So God does not consider what? That's what he talks about. And God just inputs righteousness. You, you understand? Now look at what he says now. So David, number seven. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. And whose sins are covered. Under the Old Testament sins are covered. Under the New Testament sins are wiped out completely. Verse 8. Blesses is, is, blesses the man to whom the Lord shall not input sin. So what are we looking at? We are looking at the righteousness that the gospel revealed. The righteousness that the gospel made available to us as a gift. <coughs> and the Bible said this righteousness is only received by faith in Christ. It is our faith that is accounted as this righteousness. Abraham believed God and God called it righteousness. The guy told lies. God still called it righteousness. His faith. Why? Because even though his action. Now listen to this. Even though his action, he failed in his action. He was not steadfast in his action. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? Now he did right today. Tomorrow because of the prevailing circumstances, he failed. But his faith in God remained the same. Do you understand? His faith was constant. And what God equates as a righteousness is faith, not works. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So that's what you need to understand. Now let's move to chapter 10. 
The same Romans chapter, uh, Romans now, let's look at chapter 10. The book of Romans chapter 10. Or oh, let's, let, let's check the, the first chapter, chapter 9. So there's a righteousness that you can have without you working for it, without you keeping the law. And that righteousness is the better righteousness. It is God's own righteousness. Romans chapter 9. Now look at from verse 30 now. What shall we say then that Gentile? Don't forget the Gentiles are the non-Jews. And we are regard to our sinners. Who did not pursue righteousness? They were not even trying to live right. They were like idol worshippers. They were adulterers. They were drunkards. But listen to this. They have attained to righteousness. Even the righteousness of faith. How come those who are not even striving to live right? How come they attain to righteousness? Okay, let's read further. Verse 31. But Israel, that is the Jew now, pursuing the law of righteousness. They were striving to be right. All right? They were trying to keep the commandment. And so that they can have a right standing with God. So that they can have a right status before God. But has not attained the law of righteousness. But they were not righteous. God didn't call them righteous. So why? Verse 32 now. So the question, why? He said because they did not seek it by faith. They wanted to be righteous. They wanted to have a right standing with God. But they did not seek it by faith. So how did they seek it? But as it were, by the works of the law. They were seeking it by their performance. They were thinking if they could keep the law. If they could try and keep seven out of ten. Maybe God would be pleased. But not to please God as 100%. 99.999% <laughs> does not please God. Why? Because God is a perfect God. If you want to keep all the law to be righteous, then you must keep everything. Not once, not for 10 years, but all through your life. But no man can do that. You, you understand what I'm talking No man can do that without slipping, without falling, without failing. And so the Bible says, those who seek righteousness by their works, they did not attain it. But the Gentiles that were not even, they don't even know the Ten Commandments. You understand what I'm talking about? But they believe the Savior. When God said, here is the Savior offer for your sin, they just believe him. And God declared them righteous. Alright? So let's read further. Move to chapter 10 now. Look at it from verse 1. <coughs> Romans 10 from verse 1 now. Brethren, this Paul talking here. My heart desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. They were trying to keep the commandments said they are not saved. <laughs> Verse 2, for I bear them witness that he have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. There are many religious zealots today. You, you, you understand? For Allah, for God, as they claim to. But the Bible says it's not according to knowledge. All right? Now look at verse 3. Now look at where I'm going. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. There are a lot of Christians today that are ignorant of what? God's righteousness. So what do they know? Their own righteousness. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? Oh, oh, uh, because I've not been doing this, that's why this is happening to me. No, that means you don't know God's righteousness. Oh, God is not answering my prayer because I am not living right. No, you are not. You, you, you are ignorant of God's righteousness. Yeah. God's righteousness is constant. Once it is credited to your account, Every day of your life, every time, God sees you as righteous. Yeah. Do you understand? What I, because this righteousness is apart from the law. It's apart from your works. Oh, I just fell. I just fall into sin. I just made a terrible mistake. When you stand before God, he does not see you as a sinner. Do you know why? Because he has given you to something that is everlasting. It is his righteousness. It is irreversible. It is imputed. It is given. It's a gift. He can't take it away from you. So every time you appear before God, as long as you continue in faith in Christ, you are righteous. You are righteous. You need to be conscious of that. You don't let the devil talk you out. You don't let the devil call you a sinner. You don't let the devil call you a drunkard. You don't let the devil call you a fornicator. You don't let the devil call you an adulterer. You tell the devil, you are just looking at the action. You don't know my condition. I have righteousness of God in Christ. Yes, 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 yes. I have God's righteousness. So you need to be aware of God's righteousness. The children of Israel, they are ignorant of God's righteousness. And so they are confused. How can the Gentiles 
Those who don't have the Ten Commandments. How can God say they are righteous? How can God say now they have Abraham blessing? When we have the Ten Commandments and we are trying, we are keeping eight, we are keeping seven, we are trying to keep nine. And God says we are not righteous. And God says we are not saved. It's because they are ignorant of God's righteousness. And it is the gospel that reveals God's righteousness. Okay, look at what Paul says for them. He said they are seeking to establish their own righteousness. That's always what happens. When you are ignorant, now listen to me, of the truth of the gospel, that you are righteous through your faith in Christ Jesus. Do you know what you'll be trying to do? You'll be trying to be righteous in God's sight. You, you, you understand what I'm So that's why when you come to church, you are coming to church to be righteous. When you pray, when you give, you are doing it to be righteous so that God can accept you. Not knowing, now listen to me, even though it is good for you to come to church, you understand that not coming to church does not change your status as being righteous in God's sight. Are you with me? It's good to give to God, but not bringing your offering doesn't change your status. Now that is the gospel truth. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So you need to know that, that God has given you to something, it's called righteousness, and it is God righteous. As long as God is righteous, you remain righteous, because what he gives to you is what he has, his own righteousness. That's what Paul is talking about here. So when you are ignorant of that, you will try to establish your own righteousness. That is the problem of the Jew. You, everything you want to do is so that I can, I can have a right standard before God. So that God can accept me. So that God can love me. So that God can bless me. Alright? So he said, you have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law. For righteousness to everyone who believe. So if you believe Christ, now listen to this. That's righteousness. Okay, now look at, look at verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. So the righteousness, listen to this. So there's a righteousness that is called the righteousness of the law. It is our righteousness. It is man's righteousness. And that righteousness is according to your performance. By our standard. Now, somebody that does things right, we say that guy is right, that lady is right. That's a righteous person, all right? Because by our standard, she's performing, she's doing things right. Do you understand? Now, that kind of righteousness is man's righteousness. That kind of righteousness is what is called the righteousness of the law. Do you know the problem with that righteousness? It is not lasting. That kind of righteousness is not constant. It's not consistent. Because that person that is doing things right today, tomorrow she may fail. Because that's the nature of man. And that is why such a righteousness does not give you any status, any, any standing before God. Because it is not a lasting righteousness. It is not a perfect righteousness. That lady, that man that you think is doing things right, get closer to him. Get closer to her. Check his or her thoughts. Then you will know that she's not as right as you think she is. That is why God, through the gospel, offers us his own righteousness. But unfortunately, many of us, we don't receive God's righteousness. Are you listening? We are not conscious of God's righteousness. We don't see ourselves as being righteous all the time in spite of our actions. I really wish you get it. You understand? When you understand it, 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 it establishes you. You understand? You don't see yourself, you don't call yourself by your actions. Are you listening? But that is what the devil wanted to think. They wanted to think you are still a sinner. It's just occasionally that you are a righteous person. But that's not the truth. The devil still tells you that, look, you are still, you are still failing. But that's not the truth. You are growing. You are learning. Are you listening to what? Now you make mistakes. But God does not call you by those mistakes. Alright? So, but look at what he said in number 6. But the righteousness of faith the righteousness of faith, the righteousness that God gives, speaks in this way. So he said, the righteousness of faith, you receive it by what you say. Okay, so what do you say? Look at verse 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with heart, one believes unto righteousness. And with mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So we receive the righteousness of God, which is called the righteousness of faith, 
by believing and confessing that of a truth, Jesus died for our sin. And that is our Savior. Hallelujah. Do you receive what God's word? Look at Isaiah 61 verse 10. You need to receive God's word and believe what God says. You have God's righteousness. Let's have say, I have God's righteousness. I have God righteousness. All right. Isaiah 61. Look at Isaiah chapter 61. So the gospel of righteousness is that God's righteousness is available for all who believe in Christ Jesus. Isaiah 61. Look at verse 10. Isaiah 61 verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with what? The garment of salvation. He has covered me with what? The robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom deck himself with ornament. And as a bride adorn himself with a jewel. So the Bible says you are covered. Let's all say I am, I am covered. With the robe of righteousness. And listen to me. That one is not what you made for yourself. That is what God made for you. Now listen to me. That is the righteousness of God himself. Now, so what God did for us, when we put our faith in Christ, that God took away the robe of righteousness of Christ. Are you listening to me? Then he covered us with it. So every time we appear before God, are you listening to me? God sees us covered. We are righteous. Your sins, your iniquities, they are covered. They are covered. Because you have on you all the time God's own robes of righteousness. God's own robes of righteousness. It's so important for you to understand that. 2 Corinthians 5.21 The Bible says, He made him who need no sin to be sin for all, that we might become what? The righteousness of God in Christ. Let's have say, I am, I am God's righteousness in Christ Jesus. So what will this do for you? What will that do for you? Look at what that will do for you. Romans chapter 5. So understanding the gospel of righteousness, what do I stand to gain from that? When well, you understand according to what the Bible says, Colossians 1 verse 22, that in God's presence you are holy, you are blameless, and you are above reproach in God's sight. So what will that do? What, what is the blessing in that? Why do I need to be conscious that I have God's righteousness as a robe that cover me? I have God's righteousness imputed to me. What will that do for me? Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Let's look at that before we move forward. Romans chapter 5. Look at verse 17 now. For if by one's, by the one man's offense, death reign through the one, much more, those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, we do what? Reign in life. Let somebody say reign in life. Yeah. Through the one, Jesus Christ. So look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, when you have received the gift of righteousness, and you are conscious of it, that you are righteous all the time. Are you listening to me? In spite of your action, that God sees you as holy. God sees you as blameless. Be above reproach in his sight. God sees you as his own righteousness. The Bible says, that will empower you to reign in life. To reign in life, it means to prevail. To reign in life, it means to, to have supremacy. To reign in life, it means that when the devil comes against you, when anything comes against you, you are able to overcome it. You are able to stand your ground and say, no, I'm going to resist the devil. And when you resist the devil, the devil will flee. But the Bible says you can only do that if you are conscious of your righteousness. And that righteousness is the one that is given to you as a gift. That's why he call it the gift of righteousness. The reason why many Christians are not ready is because they are ignorant that they have always the gift of righteousness. So when you do not know that you are righteous, you will accept whatever the devil brings your way. Do you know what? You will take it as the punishment of your sin. I just told you about the brother that we went to pray with. He took the punishment that what was happening to him was as a result of his sin. You, you understand? So, he was not able to prevail. He was not able on his own to, to resist the devil. Why? Because he already accepted that he's not righteous. And it is the righteous that prevail. So, righteousness makes you red. That's why I said, Christian, now listen to me. 
Be conscious of the righteousness that God has given to you all the time. Because that is what will make you reign. That is what will empower you. That is what we grant you the boldness to stand and tell the devil, no, you can't do this to me. And the devil will put it in your mind and say, that is the punishment of your sin. It's because you did this. That's why this is happening. You tell the devil, no, you don't get it. I have the gift of righteousness. I didn't do anything to get it. I didn't keep the law to get it. So breaking the law does not mean you lose it. You know, at times the devil doesn't know the gospel. You need to preach the gospel to the devil. That in the gospel, the righteousness of God is given as a gift. And when you receive it through faith in Christ, you have it forever. Do you understand what I'm talking about? All right? Now, so, the, 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 receiving the gift of righteousness will cause you to reign in life. Now, look at what the Bible says, Proverbs 20, verse 1. The Bible says, The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Let's have said, The righteous are bold as a lion. So, righteousness gives boldness. It imparts boldness to us. Now, listen to this. When you are driving and the police stop you, are you listening to what I'm talking about? If you know you are not a criminal, you don't have gun, you don't have any uh, contraband or illegal things in your car, you have all your papers, all your documents, it's not a stolen vehicle, are you going to be fidgeting and trembling? Of course you are not. You'll be bold. Hello, officer, what can I do for you? You, you? you understand what I'm talking about? But a criminal will not show such boldness. Do you understand? Now, that's what righteousness do. It's impact boldness. So if I know and I'm conscious that I'm righteous always, that I'm righteous all the time, and it is not because I do things right all the time, but because I have righteousness of God imputed to me, it's because I am clothed with God's righteousness. Do you know what? I'll be bold all the time. Yes. Not just having boldness towards the devil to receive the devil, but also boldness to approach God. Boldness to call God your father. Boldness to ask God whatever you want. Many people cannot pray boldly. Are you listening to me? Because they have a consciousness of sin. When they stand, the devil is telling them, no, 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 no. God is not going to listen to someone like you. Are, are you listening to what I'm talking about? I remember someone sometimes ago was telling me, he wanted to pray, and the devil tell me, now listen to this. The devil said this to him, he said, God can't answer your prayer. Your mouth is smelling of alcohol. <laughs> So don't, don't even bother to pray. Alright? If you don't know the scripture, say your person will not pray. You understand? We just accept it. That God is not going to hear him pray because his man is smelling of alcohol. Say that's stupid. <laughs> Who told you God is smelling that? God is a spirit. Alright? And God relates with you in the spirit. Okay? If you take alcohol, you are just the one messing up your body. What concern God with that? Do you understand what I'm talking about? You need to know that in God's sight, you are holy. You are righteous all the time. Oh, does that mean you should take alcohol? No. If you are smart, you know, <laughs> too much of alcohol can do damage to your body. But listen to me. Your relationship with God, it has nothing to do with it. Now, that's the truth you need to know. It has nothing to do with it. So you need to understand, and that's what I'm trying to tell you, that you may have boldness towards God all the time. That's why many of us cannot pray boldly. That's why many of us cannot read the Bible boldly. That's why many of us cannot talk to God boldly because we are not conscious that God sees us as righteous. Because we have His righteousness. We have His righteousness. Look at what the Bible says. You need to see this scripture. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 6. The book of Proverbs chapter 10. Look at verse 6. Verse 6. 6. The Bible says, Blessings... I was on the head of the righteous. Do you have that in your Bible? So what do you have on your head? Blessing. blessing. I said what do you have on your head? Blessing. So blessings are on the head of the righteous. Do you see why you have to see yourself as a righteous all the time? Because the blessings of God are only released where? Upon the head of the righteous. That's why the devil tells you you are a sinner. <coughs> That's why the devil wanted to agree with him all the time that you are not righteous. Because once you agree with that, listen to me, you don't receive the blessings of God. You don't enjoy the blessings of God. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Now, so that's why the consciousness of righteousness is so crucial. Because 
The blessings of God flow towards the righteous. And the righteous, don't forget in God's sight, are not those who do things right all the time. The righteous are those who believe right all the time. We believe in the Lord Jesus. So righteousness to God is believing right. Not about doing right. Oh, does God... Does that mean that God is God doesn't like those who do things? Of course not. But God wants you to believe right first. What you do should flow out of what you believe. You understand what I'm talking about? God wants you to do right, but listen to me. What is more important for you is to believe right. When you believe right, you, you live right. So, now, you need to know this because the blessings of God are on the head of those who are righteous and whose righteousness are not based on their actions, but their righteousness is received as a gift from God and they are conscious that they have it all the time. So, if you are conscious of that, that is the righteousness of God imputed to you, you live in the blessings of God all the time. So, if I'm righteous, I know what is on my head is not family cause. That's why many Christians they think they are cause. <laughs> because they don't know that they are now righteous. And cause can stay on the head of the righteous. You don't understand what the gospel is. That's the gospel. Now, the cause don't rest on the head of the righteous. The only thing God permits on the head of the righteous is the blessing. So, the devil does not want you to see yourself as being righteous all the time. Because that is the only way he can put a cause on you. And that is why the gospel, now understanding the gospel of righteousness, that makes you righteous all the time. That's what I'm saying. Now, what that will do to you is that it will make it impossible for any cause to rest on your head. You will carry God's blessing, God's favor all the time. You will walk in God's blessing. You will see God's blessing flowing in your life because you know all the time that you are righteous. And that righteousness is not because you are doing things right. But because you believe right, you put your faith in the Savior, Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Do we understand why the gospel is called the gospel of righteousness now? Yeah. Alright. Now let's move forward quickly. The gospel is also called in the Bible, the gospel of his salvation. The gospel. So why is it the gospel of salvation? Look at what the Bible says. First Chronicles chapter 16. What will understand the gospel as the gospel of salvation do to you? Alright, let's check it out. Quickly, 1 Chronicles 16, look at verse 23. 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 23. Now, sing to the Lord all the heart. Now, look at David here, where they were uh, uh, putting the heart in his place in the tabernacle. Now, David began to sing this song. He said, sing to the Lord all the heart. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. So what do we proclaim to people? The good news. Don't forget the gospel is good news. The gospel of his salvation. Let's have said the good news, good news. of his salvation. salvation. Alright. So what does that mean? Let's look at this time, this adjective. The good news of his salvation. His salvation. So what does that mean? Now that tells you that salvation is God's own. It's from God. It's it is his own salvation. Apart from God, we cannot be saved. That's what it means. It simply means that nothing else can bring salvation to us. No one can save us. Salvation is exclusively God's own. God is the Savior. Do you understand what I'm talking about? You can't save yourself, I cannot save myself. No man, nobody can save you. No good work to do can save us. You understand? No religion can save us. Salvation is in God. God is the one that saved. That is why the gospel is called the gospel of God's own salvation. Because the gospel presents the truth that salvation is only in God. Salvation comes from God. And don't forget salvation. I told you in Greek means soteria. And what it means is there's some benefit or some blessing. There's some blessing that we receive from God through Christ Jesus. That's what we call salvation. That includes healing. That includes happy home. That includes you achieving your goals in life. Fulfilling your dreams in life. That includes good and long life, peace, prosperity. That includes health, deliverance, victory. You need to know that it comes from God. 
God is the source. It is God that gives it. So if God does not save, you cannot be saved. If God does not heal, you cannot be healed. You understand what I'm talking about? That's why it is vain putting your trust in the doctor. Oh, doctors are good. God uses them. But you don't put your own confidence in them. Do you know why? Because they make mistakes. They give wrong prescription. I, I, I was hearing a man that was giving a testimony of how a team of surgeons that work on him forgot their scissors and some things in him. I said, oh, so that's possible. <laughs> I said, what were they thinking? So you can't put, and that, the man almost died. Because they didn't know that something, and he kept complaining of pain. And they said, but you are okay. The operation was successful. Now, that's why we don't put our trust in men. Because salvation comes from God alone. So that's why the gospel is called the gospel of his salvation. Because God is the one that saved. God is the one that healed. So when you are sick, ask God to heal you first. Alright? Do you understand what I'm talking about? Oh, does that mean you should not seek for medical? You need to do that. You understand? But know that God is the healer. Alright? God can use your uh, medicine. Use, but put your trust in God. In God. You, you understand what I'm talking about? Alright? God is the one that delivers. God is the one that gives victory. God is the one that prospers. So don't put your trust, your confidence in your effort alone. You listen to what I'm talking about because your effort alone may not guarantee success and prosperity from you. Promotion comes from God. Success comes from God. So that's what the gospel teaches. That's what you need to know. That it is called the gospel of his salvation because in the gospel, now listen to it, salvation only comes from one source and it comes only from God. It comes only. So you want salvation, you need to go to God, you need to ask God, you need to put your trust and your confidence in God. Now let's read Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse 13. 1, 3. Ephesians 1 verse 13. In him you also trusted, Paul talking here, after you had the word of truth. So he's talking uh, to, 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 to the Christians here. At the verse, he said, yes, you trusted in God after you hear the word of truth. So what happened? He said, you trusted when you had the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So you see first, the gospel is presented to us as a gospel of his salvation because God is the source. God is the author. God is the giver of salvation. Every good thing comes from where? From God. That's what the Bible says. Every good gift, perfect gift comes from, from above. From the Father of light. Every good thing comes from Him. Not from man. From God. Now listen to this. Now here, now you're not called the gospel. The gospel of your salvation. Now, of our salvation. Now, what is he talking about? Now, he's saying now that we are now recipient of God's salvation. We are now the beneficiary. So that is why it is also called of your salvation. Now, we are not the source. God is the source, but we are what? The recipient. We are the beneficiary. Hallelujah. Now, this is important. Now, listen to this. So why is this so important? Why is this so important to understand this? Why is this so important to understand? Now, it is important to understand this and listen to this because if you do not understand that salvation comes from God, now what will happen to you is that you will strive and struggle on your own to receive salvation. You put all your confidence in yourself. You put all your trust in your effort, in what you can do. Because you do not know that God gives salvation and he gives it as a gift, a free gift. Do you understand? So many people don't receive from God, not because they don't want to receive from God. Are you listening to me? But because they do not know how to receive from God. God wants us to approach him with a simple faith, knowing that he has what you are asking him for. You understand? Because it is his salvation. God is the author. God, it, salvation is God's promise. God is the one that promised to save us. We look at this when we look at the gospel of God. Luke 1, 67. 
uh, uh, to 75 that salvation was promised by God. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? And he fulfilled that promise when he sent Jesus to die for our sins on the cross. So salvation, healing, God is the one that promised to heal us when we sin, when we fall sick. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? So God expects, now when I have challenge with my health, God expects me to ask him. Do you know why? Because he promised, he promised. And God expects me to believe in him. So when I forget about God and I put my trust in medicine, when I forget about God and I put my, my, my trust in another man, in my own effort, do you know what? Then I don't understand the gospel. And the devil can take advantage of that. After all, you are not trusting God. And then you take the medication and the medication, you, you develop allergy to it. You understand? And, and something go wrong. And the devil say, keep trusting the medicine. Keep taking more. Take more. <laughs> and that's killing you. It's not helping. You have a lot of people like that. But when you put your trust in God, and you know that God is your healer. Now, even if it is a uh, Panadol that you take for, for stomach uh, pain, somehow it works. <laughs> and then they say, oh, you mean that's what you took for it? <laughs> but it still works. Because God, you recognize God as the one that heals you. And because he has promised to heal you. And listen to this, you don't have to do anything to impress him. He's the one that promised. It is his salvation. Are you listening to me? But he doesn't need the salvation. We are the one that need the salvation. And he makes it available as a free gift. That's why it now becomes your salvation. You understand? So we need to receive it from God. We need to know it. And when we, when we have this right understanding that salvation belongs to God, all right, and that God wants us to be recipient of his salvation, we'll be quick to receive from God. We'll be quick to receive from God. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. And listen to this. Many people today are lost, they are condemned because they reject the gospel of God's salvation. Look at what the Bible says. The book of Mark chapter 16. Many people say, well, is that so simple? Just believe in the Lord Jesus and confess him as the Lord and Savior and you are saved. They say, yes, that's it. And that's why they reject it. Because it looks so simple. How can you say, and that's the way you are saved and when you die you don't go to hellfire without doing anything. Just by believing. <laughs> Do you know why? Because they don't understand that it is God's salvation. And he said that's the way he wants to give it. It's just like you having something. It's your home. Are you listening to what I'm, And you say, well, if you can just say, uh, good morning, sir. I'm going to give this to you. And somebody say, but uh, how can somebody just receive something by just saying, good morning, sir? Is it not your home? <laughs> and you have chosen the way to give it. That's what people don't understand. Salvation belongs to God. And God said, the way I will give it is you confess the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you receive my salvation. It's as simple as that. So that's the gospel. You need to know that it is God's salvation. And God has chosen the way we give it. So we need to know the way God says we give it. And when we follow the way, we get God's salvation. Mark 16, look at it. 15 and 16. Now Jesus here, talking to his disciple after he rose from the dead. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So what do we preach to people? The gospel to yeah. so every creature. Verse 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Simple. But if who does not believe what? Yeah. Will be condemned. <laughs> he who does not believe. He didn't say he who does not uh, live right or do things right. It's just saying he who does not believe. It's as simple as that. Do you know why? Because it is his salvation. And he said the way that we give it is only to those who believe. To those who believe. So the gospel is called the gospel of salvation. And listen to this. It is because God is the one that gives salvation. And he gives it to those who believe. To those who believe in Christ Jesus. So that's what we need to preach to. When people say, so you mean by believing alone I can be healed. You understand? At times I pray for people in healing, healing line. Just say, Pastor, is that all I should do? Just say this prayer with you and believe. I say, yes, what else? <laughs> At times I say, what else do you want to do? The healer said, that's the way we give you healing. He said, he give, he's giving you as a gift. Do you know why many are not receiving it? Because they don't see it as a gift. 
They argue with the giver. But God, ah, can you give it like that? It's so, so simple, so cheap like that. No. The giver said, that's the way I want to give the blessing. That's the way I want. But many of us are saying, no, let me impress you. Let me do some good stuff. Let me, let me give you some special gift. No. He said, no, just believe me. Just believe me. So it is the gospel of salvation. And we need to be conscious of that all the time. That God is the giver of salvation. God is the soul. And that the way he gives it is us by believing. And that when we believe God, we become recipient of his salvation. So let's go and talk to people like that. All right. Now let's close with this. The everlasting gospel. So we look at the gospel as first the gospel of righteousness, the gospel of his salvation, and of course the gospel of our salvation because we are the recipient of the gospel. Now let's close with this. The gospel is also called the everlasting gospel. Let's have said the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel. So why the everlasting gospel? All right. Let's consider that. Look at Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Quickly, look at verse 6. In the book of Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. John the Beloved here, writing the revelation he received. He said, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So, why is the gospel called the everlasting gospel? Why do I need to have an understanding that the gospel is the everlasting gospel, what will that do for me? Now, the word everlasting in this uh, verse is the Greek word that is called Ionios. Now, listen to what it means. It means without beginning and end, that which always has been and always will be. It means without beginning, without end. It means never to cease. So why is the gospel described like that? In the Bible, now listen to this. The gospel is called the everlasting gospel because before sin, before the advent of sin, God's salvation has already been provided for. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Now, so before sin, before man ever fell, before man sinned, God already made provision for salvation. So before the problem came, God already had the solution waiting. That's what you need to know about God. So there is nothing that comes as a surprise to God. Revelation 13, 8 says, Jesus is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1, 4 said that we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. So even before God created man, listen to it, God had already made provision that when man fall, are you listening to me? Now Jesus will redeem man from sin. And that's why Jesus is called the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. The plan of salvation has already been written, has already been concluded, has already been sealed. Now, so what is that saying to you? Before you commit the sin that you are going to commit, the forgiveness is already available. Do you understand? Now, before sickness comes, God has already made healing available to you. Before the problem, the challenge comes, the victory is already waiting for you. Before the need comes, the provision is already waiting. That is the truth of the gospel. So I need to know this, that when I come to God and ask God for something, God is not running out and scatter, looking for where to show for what I'm looking for. He already made provision for every need that I'm going to have. God has anticipated everything that is going to happen to me. Everything that will ever confront you and God has made sufficient enough provision for you to overcome them all. That is why the gospel is called the everlasting gospel. It's a good news that we never hear. It's a good news that before the need comes, the supply is waiting. That's why it's called the everlasting God in his knowledge, full knowledge, in his wisdom. Now listen to me, knows everything you are going to need. Do you understand what I'm talking about? The right man you are going to marry. The right lady you are going to marry. God knows everything and God has provided everything. Most time we are just anxious, alright? Most time we think that, God, what are you still doing? Are you still doing something? No, he's not doing anything. 
He made the provision available. You just need his wisdom to assess the provision. You just need faith. You need to believe God. When you come to God, that God has what you are looking for. And that he already made provision for it. So that's the good news. That's why he called the everlasting good news. Before man fell into sin, the provision for salvation has already been made. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So our, the, the fall of man was not a shock to God. No, it wasn't a shock. There is nothing that the devil wants to do that's going to be a surprise to God. Because he made a victory already available for us. Alright? Now, let me close with this. Do you know why it is also called the everlasting gospel? Now look at Hebrew chapter 9. I read one more scripture and then we close. Hebrew chapter 9. The everlasting gospel. It's a good news. Good news without end. Without beginning, without end. It's a good news that will never end. It will never end. It will never end. God will always love you. Do you know what? That will never come to an end. <laughs> It will never come. God will never be tired of you. That's a good news. That's why it's called the everlasting gospel. Everlasting good news. There will never be a time that you will come and God will turn his back and say, I'm just tired of you. I'm tired of your nagging. I'm tired of your complaining. No, God will never be tired of his children who put their faith in Christ. Do you understand what I'm talking about? That's why the gospel is called everlasting good news. It is an everlasting good news that we are forever accepted to God. It is everlasting good news that we are forever. God is forever pleased with you. God is forever pleased with me in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Hebrew chapter 9. Look at Hebrew chapter 9 from verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hand that is not of this creation. Verse 12. This is where I'm coming to. Not with the blood of gold and car, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all. And what did he get for all? What did Jesus get? Having obtained what? Eternal redemption. Another word for that eternal is everlasting. So what did Jesus receive for all? Everlasting redemption. Everlasting forgiveness of sin. Everlasting victory. What he received for us is everlasting salvation. We cannot lose it. What Jesus offered to all, listen to me, you will have it forever. You will have it forever. You are saved. You are saved forever. Now, you don't have to be afraid. What if I die today? We God open the gates of heaven. We God embrace me. Now, listen to me. If you understand that the gospel is the everlasting gospel. If you are saved now, now listen to me. You are saved. When you die, you will make heaven. You will make heaven. You talk, when you understand, it gives you assurance, it gives you confidence. It gives you confidence. Are you listening to me? When now you are not afraid of death, you are not afraid of death. Do you know why? Because you know the moment you close your eyes, angels are waiting to usher you to the presence of your father. It's waiting for you. That's why it's called the everlasting. Because what you have is everlasting. What the gospel gives us is everlasting redemption. Are you listening to me? It's not something that we will lose. As long as we put our faith in the Savior. Are you listening to me? The devil cannot undo what God has done for us. Do you know something? If the devil can do it, he will stop Jesus from coming into the world. If the devil can do it, he will stop Jesus from being crucified. If the devil can do it, he will stop Jesus from rising from the dead again. But you know what? If he cannot do that, then he cannot stop the gospel from saving you. He cannot stop those who are saved, listen to me, from remaining saved till the very end. So that's why it is called the everlasting gospel. Because what we have is eternal, everlasting redemption. That's why it is called the everlasting life, what Jesus gave. Are you listening to me? So when we give a life to Christ, what do we have? Everlasting life. Another scripture call it eternal life. Eternal. Do you know what that means? The devil can't take it away. The devil can't destroy it. Oh, the devil can destroy your body, all right? But he can't destroy your soul anymore. Because it is sealed with the blood of Jesus, sealed with the Holy Spirit. You have eternal life. It is too late. There's nothing the devil can do about it. Let me close with this scripture. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. If you truly understand the gospel, you will always be excited. You will not allow depression. The worst that can happen to you is to die, isn't it? 
I always tell myself, I said, the worst that can happen is that I die. <laughs> and do you know what? If I die, I don't lose. Yeah. You go to heaven and you go and rest. All right? <laughs> Praise God. Hebrews chapter 10. So you have eternal salvation. There's nothing the devil can do about it. He can't shut the gate of heaven against you. It's too late. It's too late. You are saved. And what you have is eternal. It's everlasting. Hebrews chapter 10. And let's close with this. From verse 11. The Bible says every high priest stand ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. Talking of what they do under the old covenant. That's why every time when you sin, you always have to come back and offer animal. Now, verse 12 now, but this man, talking about Jesus now, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin, let's say one sacrifice, one sacrifice. forever sat down at the right hand of God. So Jesus is not doing anything again. Because what he had done was perfect. All right. And it's irreversible. Verse 13, from that time, waiting till his enemies had made his footstool. Verse 14 now, please pay attention. For by one offering, that is by his death, he has perfected. Let's say perfected. perfected. For, forever, those who are being sanctified. Oh, that's awesome. That scripture is huge. It's deep. The Bible says you have been what? Perfected. For now, no. For some time, no. For forever. Let's say I am perfected. I am perfected. Forever. forever. <laughs> Everything about you, God has perfected it. He said, Forever, those who have been sanctified now. See two things here. Perfected forever, okay? Action completed. Then you see the program. Those who have been saved, those who have been sanctified. Now listen to it. Even while we are still growing, all right? Now, we are yet to get everything that God promised. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Even when you have not got all the blessings, all the answer to your prayer. Now listen to me. Don't let the devil tell you that something is wrong somewhere with your salvation. Your salvation is perfect. You are perfected already by God. Are you listening to me? It's just a matter of time. Your prayer will be answered. You are going to grow up. You are going to mature. You are going to be who God wanted to be. But listen to me. From God's own perspective, He's perfected. Your salvation is what? He's perfected. When Christ comes, even though I feel pains in this body, I tell the body is weak. Listen to me. My salvation is perfect. And when Jesus comes, now listen to this. If I'm alive and I see Jesus, I'm going to put on a new body. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? So from God's perspective, from God's view, from God's angle, you are already perfected. And I love the way the Bible put it. The Bible says it's forever. It's eternal. It's everlasting. Everything about your salvation is already sealed. It's already sealed. The devil cannot mess it up. Are you listening to me? The devil cannot tamper with it. He can tamper with the body. He can tamper with the things that you are. But listen to me, your soul, your spirit, he can tamper with it. What God has reserved for you, he can tamper with it. You are perfected. Let's say I'm perfected forever. Now look at, look at, look at verse 19 now. Now I said, therefore, so if you understand this, if you understand that what you have is eternal redemption, if you understand that everything about you has been perfected, you are waiting for his manifestation. I'm waiting for God to give me the answer to my prayer. I'm waiting for that miracle. I'm waiting for that things to happen. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? But I need to know it's perfected. It will appear. God will do it. Do you understand what I'm talking about? All right? Now, it's just like a product. The product you see uh, 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 in the market, okay? In the mall, they are product perfect. Is that right? But you know, it takes a while, it takes a time before they are transitioned from the factory to the, to the mall, to the, to, the, to the store, isn't it? Now, why they are there, they are perfect, eh? but they are not yet, they have not yet manifested. Do you understand what I'm talking about? But they are what? They are already perfected. Everything you want from God, that's the way you need to see it. Everything about your life is already perfected. Are you listening to me? It's just a matter of time. It will manifest. Now, so that's why you have to be steadfast. Don't let the devil, don't entertain doubt and unbelief. Don't let the devil tell you, God doesn't love you more. God, God is not pleased with you. God is angry. No, that's a lie. Are you listening to me? It's just time. It's just time. You just need to be patient. Now, verse 19, let's close with this. Dear for brethren, 
having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, okay, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for all through the veil that is his flesh. So what do we do? Verse 22, let us draw near. Tell somebody, say, draw near. Draw near. Okay, with a true, a uh, full assurance of faith. Verse 23, let us all fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promise is faithful. Let's rise to our feet. Tell someone say, God who promise is faithful. It's faithful. Do you know what that word faithful means? That he will keep his promise. What that means that God will do exactly what he said he will do. What you read in the Bible that God promised, he will do it for you. He will do it for you. And listen to me. He's doing it for you. It's not based on your performance. He's doing it for you. It's based on faith in Christ. As long as you continue in faith in Christ Jesus, God will do it. God will do it. So the Bible says, hold fast to the confession of your faith. Hold fast. Don't doubt it. Don't let the devil deceive you. Don't doubt whether you are saved or not. Don't doubt whether you are righteous or not. Don't doubt whether God loves you or not. He loves you. He loves you. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Things may not be going the way you want it. But listen to me. You are perfected forever. Everything about you is perfected. It is just a matter of time. It will manifest. It will happen. Yes. It will happen. It will happen. So the Bible says, you keep drawing near to God. Don't let the devil take you further away from God. Keep drawing near. Tell someone say, draw near. draw near. Every day, draw near to God. Draw near, draw near, draw near, draw near. Draw near to God. Draw near to God in full assurance of faith. And do not, do not, do not doubt. Do not waver. Do not waver. Do not waver. For God who promises faith. I want you to talk to God. Say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me not to doubt. Help me not to waver. Help me to hold fast the confession of my hope until the very end. I mean to always remember and believe that you love me. That I'm righteous. That I'm holy. Lord, that I'm blameless in your sight. That you love me and that you will never stop loving me. I want you to pray. Say, Father, help me. I mean to remember all the time that what I've received is the gospel of righteousness and that I'm righteous all the time. I mean to remember always, Lord, that you made me righteous. That what I have is your righteousness and it is everlasting righteousness. I mean to remember always that you are the source of salvation. You are the giver of salvation and you love me so much. You will not hold back anything from me. You will not hold back anything from me. Lord help me to remember always that what I have received is the everlasting gospel. I have eternal redemption. I am already perfected forever. The devil cannot undone me. The devil cannot destroy me anymore. It is too late for the devil. I am saved and I'm saved forever. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, thank you, Father. Lord, I ask this morning, much more than I can ever explain, Lord, that will help your people, Lord. Everyone under the sound of my voice will understand the gospel as the gospel of righteousness. That the righteousness of God is now available to mankind. And that those of us who believe and put our faith in Christ, we now have God's righteousness in put to rob, and you see us as a righteous all the time, in spite of our weaknesses, in spite of our failure, in spite of us stumbling, Lord, often time. Lord, help us to remember always that we will come with boldness unto you, that we will pray with boldness, that we will resist the devil with boldness, that we will not listen to the devil, that we will remember that we are not sinners anymore, that we are not God's children, and that we are acceptable, and that we are loved by God. Help us to remember, Lord, that what we have is eternal redemption, is everlasting salvation, because what we believe is the everlasting gospel. Lord, I pray, Lord, for as many that are struggling, Lord, that are still struggling to believe, to accept your law, as many that are thinking that for one reason or the other, you don't love them as much as you loved them before. Lord, I come against every of such thought. I come against every of such spirit, Lord, every spirit of the devil, every negative spirit that speak negative things. That so negative talk. I rebook them in the life of your people. I bind them and I break their power and I show them up in the name of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Father. 
Lord, everything, Lord, that you have given, everything, Lord, that you have released, everything that you have perfected, Father, that you have given to us, we receive now. And we call them to manifestation. Our miracles that have been perfected, we receive them now. We call them to reality. I pray for each and every one here, Lord, trusting you for something unique and specific before the end of this year. I ask, Lord Jesus, let there be a manifestation of the miracle, of the blessing, of Lord, answers to prayers in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Do you receive God's word this morning? Can you say a big amen? Amen. amen? amen. Glory be to Jesus. We hope you have been challenged, encouraged, and motivated to become more like Christ by today's teaching. If you would like to find out more about Errands of Revival and get additional teachings and materials for your healthy, spiritual growth, Visit our website today at www.eradsofrevival.org.uk Or if you would like to enroll at our School of Discipleship, visit our website www.theschoolofdiscipleship.org.uk This teaching was made possible by the prayers and generous free will offering donation and gifts from partners like you you are welcome into partnership with us today for information on how to become a partner please call 1-868-292-9270 or 1-868-703-5572 or you can email us at info at erasofrevival.org.uk Thanks for listening.